You're yeah. seeing it? Oh, okay. Yep, me too. Great. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we have a guest today uh, from France who is, his name is uh, Caesar Har Harada. <laughs> I hope I said that right. Uh, he's been developing the Protei project, to, uh, which is an autonomous robot that uh, cleans up oil spills. And I think that's cool enough that I don't really need to say anything more. Uh, so, Caesar, I'll let you talk. And you've got a bunch of people on Air Mozilla. I'll be on the Air Mozilla IRC monitoring for questions if people want to ask uh, from the network. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ben, for the uh, introduction. So I put the um, FileZilla color, so I hope I can blend into your landscape. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Cesar Harda, I'm 28, French-Japanese, and I'm going to be presenting to you today uh, the Prote project, so it's an open hardware shape-shifting sailing robot. So I'm going to tell you about the story behind it and also like what, what is our current development and where we're going. Um, so it started in the Gulf of Mexico, so this is the old spill. It happened, it started on the 10th of April, 2010. Um, you know, this is, this is like the, the biggest environmental accident in the history of the United States. And so just in numbers, 4 million barrels, 65,000 kilometers of dead zones, uh, 1,000 miles of uh, kilometers of coast destroyed, um, 17 people dead, uh, millions of fishes and birds affected, so it's, it's like 2 billion dollar like um, cost and so so the explosion happened environmental disaster and the, the map I'm showing to you here is a uh, Ushahidi generated map so it's uh, civilians reporting uh, where the oil is going and so it's a different map from what the government gives so it's like open sourced um, citizen science basically and the boat that you're seeing here is um, it's a shrimping boat, so they used to take normal shrimping boat to capture the oil on the surface, and altogether during the oil spill they captured only three percent of the oil. So out of the millions of barrels, uh, hundreds of boats were deployed, but only three percent was collected from the surface, and the health of cleaners was uh, very badly exposed. So they were using not only collecting oil but also the dispersant, which is a highly toxic carcinogen. And so the life expectancy, uh, for example, of the, of the cleaners of the last oil spill, uh, the Exxon Valdez in Alaska, um, like about 25 years ago, really dropped uh, because of the activity of cleaning up. So at the time when the oil spill happened, uh, I was working in, um, in MIT in Boston, and um, I was uh, leading a team to uh, develop an oil spill cleaning technology. But um, the focus was really trying to develop long-term uh, technologies. And also the fact is that the technology we're developing was going to be patented and very expensive, potentially, and it would take many years to deploy it. And so even though uh, being project, project leader at MIT was my dream job, uh, I made one field trip to the Gulf of Mexico where I saw what was really happening and talked to fishermen, went on like, uh, like uh, uh, cleaning sessions and stuff. And so I realized that I maybe Sometimes technological progress doesn't have to be such a leap, but maybe sometimes we can do incremental technology uh, progress. And maybe it's also a good idea to make it open source because all spills are not happening only in the US where we have the resource, or I mean, we, I mean where you have the resource <laughs> to uh, develop expensive technology. So a few weeks after this, you had another uh, oil spill happening in Dalian in China. A few weeks after, you had another one in New Zealand. Uh, just a few weeks ago, you had a major uh, accident on the coast of Italy and the major risk of like oil uh, seepage from uh, this uh, big uh, ship. So oil spills are like um, like big major environmental problem, like global, and we need open source technology to lower the cost to gain ac to give access to everybody. So um, so the idea is that I I moved to the New Orleans and I had no much resource, but I had this idea of like changing how we think about like cleaning up the oil spill and changing the ethics behind like uh, de technology development. And so usually uh, when you develop a technology or a normal company, they think of profit as the main uh, focus and technology is what you use to make profit and the people are used as a, uh, I'd say, um, like a human resource basically, more than, you know, people. <laughs> and the environment is something that you can add as a label to uh, increase your price tag 
So you could make your technology more expensive if you say it's green. But in fact, um, the world doesn't work like this. Like, I mean, everybody knows that like, if you don't have the environment, you don't have a society, you don't have technology, you don't have money. So if we're trying to take things in the way they actually work, and if you're trying to, to respect like, uh, yeah, how, how, what is the real order of priority, so I was, that, that was basically what I got out of MIT and I was thinking this is the way I want to develop technology. And so, um, so coming out of a really nice lab, I was couch surfing and like building uh, prototypes in a garage of, of a lady uh, in Lake Pontchartrain. And I was volunteering for an organization called the Louisiana Bucket Brigade. And uh, I was studying how the oil moves. And so I kept observing that even though an oil spill is a man-made catastrophe, um, the way the oil moves is uh, governed by uh, natural patterns of the wind, the surface currents, and the waves. And so, you know, basically oil just drifts you, you, um, according to these forces. And so if we use these forces, we can make a technology that syncs with the natural patterns. And therefore, we, we should naturally get a better result. And so what they're doing currently is that they're taking boats and they are cleaning up through like an, an ocean of oil, essentially. And so the people are on the boat, they're eyeballing, and they're capturing the oil in booms, and they're putting, the, once they're full, they bring it up into plastic bags. They're not allowed to wear masks because uh, BP was saying that it was not good PR for them, so it's really, oh. yes. <laughs> so, so it was a very, very bad situation. And so if you look theoretically, if you're using the same length of oil boom, and you're making it into a straight line, and you go up the winds towards the source, you can capture theoretically more oil. But then if you multiply the rig, so the third image, if you have several successive layers, then you can capture much more. The issue is the amount of energy that you need to deploy to control such a big object against the wind, the wave, and the currents, because the ocean power is just immense, and so it's very difficult to work against it. But if you're using uh, like traditional sailing techniques, which is just sailing and tacking off the wind, you could actually use this force to go against the current, against the wave, and, and, and so that's, that's the premises of uh, the technology. The, the simple idea that we can sail up the wind to intercept the oil that is drifting down the wind. Um, so the first thing I did is just to take a normal sailboat and see if it was possible to sail up the wind and capture this oil. And I realized that when you are um, sailing up the wind, you are losing a lot of one thing is direction, so it's becoming difficult to direct. And the second thing is, of course, as it gets heavier, you're losing power. Uh, so I, I, I designed and prototyped this small sailing robot, which is uh, uh, a sailing boat which has the rudder at the front. So the aden advantage of this is that if you have the rudder at the front, the center board has, act as a center of rotation. And with the, uh, with the rudder at the front, you actually have much better control. It's slightly s uh, slower because you have turbulences at the at the at the, nose, at the, at the front of the, the same boat, but you gain much more control. And with a 14 centimeter rudder, with this remote control sailing boat, I could control a four meter um, oil sorbent behind a small sailing boat. So that was the confirmation that with little force, I can control a big object. So that was the kind of first obs observation and. The other observation is that uh, when I was controlling this boat, it felt like I was driving a car, kind of. When you're driving a car, you don't have the uh, steering wheel at the back, you have them at the front. If you have the steering um, of your car uh, at the back, it feels very, very strange. And then I kept thinking about the, this kind of like comparison, and I thought, what if we um, add other points of control? If not, we have, if not only we have one point of control at the front, but we have another one at the back, could we increase the control? What if we had more points of control, more than two or more than or three? And eventually I, I came up with a boat which is entirely made of rudders, so the whole boat changes shape. So uh, that's, that's a similar boat that I brought to, to you here today. But this one, so it's, the boat is changing shape. So there's no rudder and no center board, the whole boat changes shape. So you just have, so the whole boat is the point of control. There's, it's, it's just a completely different way of thinking of, of sailing. I will go um, a bit deeper after in the physics about it and how, how it changes. But essentially, you have um, a, a, like, a, like a major increase in like how much you can control the sailing boat and how much uh, you can pull 
uh, payload with it. So payload, when I say payload, means it's not only for oil, but I'll explain why you could do actually a lot more stuff with it. Um, so after I made this kind of, kind of almost like a accidental discovery of like uh, how a sailing boat could be used to control a larger object behind it, um, I wanted to know if this was a variable technology if we wanted to make bigger. So uh, I tried to make the exact same system um, with um, inflatables. So I just buy uh, you know, duct tape, um, ACE hardware and some plastic and trying to see if I could articulate an uh, inflatable setting robot. And the footprint is very lightweight, so this, this robot costs about 100, less than $100, just PVC pipes and it doesn't have mechanis mechanics inside. I was just trying to pull my own weight with, with it. So, uh, the other, so this one is 3 meter by 6.5 meter in height. Um, it's really like it's really like DIY DIY technology. So all the prototypes I'm showing to you, they are all they were all built over the course of one month. Each of them they take about one week to design, fabricate, and test. So the, the whole like mentality behind the project is really like you have an idea, just build it and, so and try it out. Sandbags that's for the, the ballast system bottom. with just like small sandbags. That's the boat. And um, so the idea of it is that the the footprint of the boat is very very tiny. So how much uh, it drags in the water is very small, and the surface of sail is very big. So you have a big power with very little uh, drag, basically. So, so it's you can like have a, like a uh, um, progress into like how you think about yeah, boats more like zeppelins versus like planes. And so uh, eventually we, we made a. After I knew this technology was viable because we could make it uh, cheaply and it could pull a lot of uh, uh, of weight, a lot of payload. And then I, I made it into a website, protei.org, and um, I just asked like people who are more qualified than myself, like you know, like ocean scientists and roboticists and hydrodynamicists, what they think this technology is worth. And they came up with the, the fact that this was really like groundbreaking, and we needed to pursue this. And so I decided to make it into a, a Kickstarter campaign. So I I put the Kickstarter campaign out, and we fundraised in three months uh, thirty-three thousand dollars. And with this thirty-three thousand uh, dollars, we and somebody here actually invested uh, on us. Maybe yes. Thank you so much for supporting us. And so uh, with this money, we uh, recruited a, a, a crew of uh, ten young engineers, and we worked in uh, Rotterdam for three months. And we built this uh, bigger iteration, so it's a three meter uh, entirely uh, remotely remotely controlled uh, prote. So you can see like the curvature of the hull is it's quite extreme and so we were controlling like bigger bigger objects so just to speak a bit about the physics uh, I brought today uh, the uh, in progress prototype it's not finished but I will use it to explain you the physics of the of the hole so um, so the first property is that it, so so there will be a sail here and there will be a jib here and that's the front of the boat and that's the back the payload will be attached behind so the first property is that when you're sailing, and like I showed you in the video, if your boat is the point of control, the whole boat is point of control, but naturally you have more control over the trajectory. When you're curving this way, you are going to definitely be in control more than with a normal boat because, I mean, the whole thing is controlling the aim. It means as well that if you are, oh yeah, okay, so if you are um, trying to uh, go to towards one fixed point, uh, when, when, when you're sailing, it's very difficult to keep an aim and you always have to adjust your, your rudder. Whereas this one, if you make slight change to the geometry of the hole, you might be able to actually um, use less energy to maintain the aim. If you just uh, like keep a certain shape of the hole, you can correct the aim constantly. The other thing is when you are turning, so it's just like when you're on a bicycle. When you're on a bicycle, you're not only turning the wheel, you're also shifting your own weight. So you're using the centrifugal force to not turn like this, but actually you get an angle and that gives you more grip. You basically, you're surfing, you're cutting in, in, into the water. That's what also this, this does. The other advantage is, so say you are the wind, and if I want to go in your direction, and it, normally normal boats would have to go like this, and then to change sides, change side. But normal boats, when you face the wind like this, then both of your sails are in front of the wind, so you're losing all power. The, the sails are going flat and you're losing pulling power. In our case, when you are facing the wind, the front, the, the, the front uh, sail, the jib, catches the wind much faster because the anchoring point 
is so much more catchy in the wind, so we never lose pulling power. If we have a payload behind, the wind starts to catch on this side, so it helps rotate faster. It means as well that we, we are reducing the radius of turning, so altogether the maneuver of a sailing boat is much faster and more stable. Um, then one other property is, if you think of an airplane wing, um, basically this one is really drafty, but um, this is shaped like an airplane, you can, you can shape it like an airplane wing, so you can decide to adjust the curvature of the hull in the shape of a wing. So you could, so an airplane wing, if you're going to say this way, and you curve this way, then you create vertical lift. But in our case, the boat is in this direction, so we don't know yet if that holds true, but at a certain speed, we are hoping that we can create lateral lift. So if we're going fast enough in this direction, then we can create this kind of motion. So if we're going towards the wind, we could go closer to the wind, or a bit further away from the wind. In any case, the interest is to create more relative motion to the wind, so we can create more speed or, again, more control. The other thing is, uh, so the first point here is that there is no center board and no rudder. The whole thing shifts. So the, the normal board has a lot of friction, I mean, that's sorry, a lot of resistance and turbulence is created in these points, but this one doesn't have either rudder or center board. So these points of resistance or turbulence just don't exist. And the last point in terms of physics, which are like major changes, is that when you have a boat and you are, so say you are sailing like this, you always have an, uh, a bit of angle. Uh, when you have waves, usually your boat goes poosh, like this and you hit the waves and if you're going fast enough. But in our case, we're just going to follow the motion of wave if we have enough elasticity in our system. So altogether, like the mechanical properties of this simple idea can really uh, be, I mean, we think it can be a big like game changer into like how how we think of sailing, not as an act of cutting the water and kind of dominating the element, but really going with the flow. So that's why I call it soft engineering. So uh, because it's developed open hardware, uh, the idea is that some members of our community are interested in other applications, not only for collecting oil, but for example, for measuring the quantities of plastic in the ocean. So here in San Francisco, I'm oh, sorry, in Mountain View. And <laughs> so you're very familiar with the accumulations of uh, plastic debris in the ocean. So, you know, so basically we, this area is not a very well studied area and there's not so much traffic or, or boats which are usually going there. It's not like a commercial route. And so if you want to be able to measure accurately uh, plastic, it would be very useful to have many small units which are resilient and, you know, that you could just put in the ocean and have tens or hundreds of them measuring simultaneously like the density of plastic because the stuff moves so it's, it's always useful to have many measurement points at the same time. Um, and there is a chain of like action that could be used that started drafting to uh, collect and treat and repurpose the plastic. Um, so I'm half Japanese and my family lives uh, about 100 kilometers away from uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant. So this is a map of, uh, of like where the radioactivity is going. I mean, some, some compounds, not all of them, uh, like significant ones. And you can see that most of them, because of the dominant wind from uh, the Russian continent, they're mostly going into the ocean. And so most of the studies are uh, concentrated in land. So what I did, I, the same way as I was approaching, like um, uh, designing new technologies for like, collecting oil, I just thought that maybe we can think of like doing citizen science and environmental measurements in a very humble, more humble way and just like trying to take techn technology as it is today and propose incremental progress. So I took a bicycle from Tokyo to Sendai. I brought some Tiger counters uh, from the guys of uh, Greenpeace and, and Safecast. And uh, so this is the area I've seen hundreds of kilometers of coast destroyed by tsunami. So these are like the strongest building completely destroyed. But the biggest effect is I was uh, meeting this fisherman and, and so the idea is to use uh, to go and have many points of independent measurement. So typically um, it's been reported. So the government is making measurements and TEPCO, the energy company is making measurements, but many uh, civilian uh, associations and residents have been making uh, measurements of radioactivity, which is sometimes 
twice as high as the measurements uh, that the government is giving. So there's a really very, very urgent need to have a, like, a verifiable and independent data about radioactivity. So um, basically, it's very important not only for the health of people, but also like if we don't have measurements of radioactivity now, people are going to get cancer or f in five or 10 years. And unless we have this data verified, then they're not going to be covered by the insurance because they can't prove that it's their illness is due to radioactivity. So it's really urgent to get data from there. Uh, another important uh, potential application for um, this kind of technology is uh, like the fishery monitoring. So currently the, there's a lot of arguments in uh, the US, for example, in the area of Massachusetts or, or Maine about the, the stocks of, um, of cod. And so they have difficulties assessing the stocks uh, it's not only in the US, for example, in the island of Pilau, where we have some of our team, uh, protein team members, they're working on assessing the stock of fish because people don't have any more fish to eat because of piracy. So we need to measure in developed countries as well as in developing countries. Um, so these are like the different types of uh, like immediately relevant applications of, of protein. So oil spills or radioactivity or current contamination risks or accumulation of plastic debris. Um, or like monitoring of protected marine protected areas, and uh, this is the the map of our, our uh, developing team. So um, I started this technology just out of a garage in New Orleans, but um, quickly people from all over the world really join join the the team. And currently, our ocean engineering is done in Norway, our three D in Mexico, uh, the wave tank in which we we train our hulls are in Chile. Um, we have people working on radioactivity sensors in Japan. Uh, artificial intelligence algorithm are done in Australia. So it's really an international team and um, actually we have uh, also some common points with Mozilla, the way we operate. So we're really, we're really new, but the way we are setting ourselves up uh, legally right now, so we are setting up, uh, we, we've set up a profit uh, startup in the UK, so R&D oriented and trying to uh, come up with like really Kind of aggressive testing and prototyping of uh, of machines in the UK, and we're setting up a non-profit in the US. And the idea is the same as Mozilla: is to have the IP hosted in a non-profit in order to guarantee that the technology is going to be used for a long time for good purposes. And so, because we're working open hardware, and we're work, like I was saying, we're working on aggressive uh, testing po uh, politics. We're working also with uh, academics and also like hacker community or like makers, basically people who just want to build it. So we're using the open hardware licensing. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these uh, principles of uh, uh, everybody is free to or invited to use, modify and distribute. And what we ask in exchange is credit, uh, credits and that they share it back with the community. And so the idea is that we not only we share the technology, but we make our community contribute to and, and grow, grow technology. And so our vision is to maybe start by making quite simple and 